So we have a standalone message this morning, and it's titled One Mission. And I am going to start by reading in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Uh, some of you might recognize this verse, maybe for some of you, it's a verse you haven't heard before, uh, but this is what we call in the church, the great commission. Uh, the great commission was delegated from heaven through Jesus to his disciples. So Jesus is saying this, and it says, and Jesus came and said to them in this verse, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And uh, we know that we are his disciples. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a disciple of him. And so this scripture is not just for the disciples uh, way back when Jesus was here and, and had his physical disciples here on earth where he was physical. This is for all of us right now. This is not just for the pastor or the leaders in the church, but we are all disciples. So the great commission is for you and it is for me. So this is for all of us. This word is spoken uh, in by authority from heaven to each of us. So we know that God is, this is, a, this is actually what we call a mandate from heaven. It came down from heaven through Jesus to his disciples, and it is still alive today. And it is a word for each of us today. Um, what I love about this scripture is the very end of it says, I am with you always to the end of the age. And we know in this scripture, Jesus was physically with his disciples. We know that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. And after that, the Holy Spirit came to be with his disciples. And how amazing is that? And that is what really Jesus is referencing is for us in this time that we have the Holy Spirit with us to guide us as his disciples to fulfill this commission. Um, I, have, I have three children. Uh, most of you probably know that. Uh, I, I'm thinking of my oldest. She's got such a great heart for the Lord. All of my children, they really do. Uh, she is 13 years old. And when she was in first grade, she was probably about six years old. We were in the van. I don't, we were driving home and we were in the car and she was asking me, you know how kids are curious about what they want to do when they grow up? They're, you know, I want to be an astronaut, a police officer, a firefighter. And she was curious, you know, she was having conversation with me. She's like, what should I do when I grow up? And I was directing her through uh, the direction of the Holy Spirit. I said, you know, you need to pray about what God would want you to do with your life as you get older. It's important that we invite the Holy Spirit into those conversations. That's a big thing. What am I going to do when, I'm get, when I get older? And as any child would do, she went immediately into prayer. I'm looking in my rear view mirror, and she's got her head bowed, and she, she is intently praying. And I, I'm just watching her, and her little head pops up. And she says, I know what I'm going to do. And I'm like, wow, okay. You know, wouldn't that be nice if the Holy Spirit, you know, gave us such direction so quickly? But uh, this is, <laughs> you know, uh, I think uh, God was just right on with this. And she did hear from the Holy Spirit. She's popped up her little, her little head and her little face. And she said, Jesus told me that I need to teach about him to people when I grow up. And so the Holy Spirit is here with us. And if you don't know the direction you should go in uh, your calling for being his disciple, it's okay. You can pray and God will give you the direction that you need. The Holy Spirit is always, always with you. Amen. So I'm going to read quickly from Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
Uh, we are called to be witnesses of him. Now, each of us have a place, right? We all have a calling. We all have a direction. All of us have different careers and families, and we're all in different phases of our lives. Uh, some of us are much further along in life, and some of us are very young in life, and some of us are just starting out in our careers, and some of us don't know which, you know, we've. I remember being in my late teens, you know, wondering which direction I need to go. And uh, in that, we, God is calling us to be witnesses of him. So some of you might be college students, and that's wonderful. But in that, that is your sphere of influence to witness uh, uh, the, the salvation of Jesus. Some of you are much further along in life. You've got, you own your own business. And in that sphere of influence, you can witness to people in your job. Uh, some of us are, you know, I stayed home with my kids for a long time. And <laughs> that is your sphere of influence. That is your place to witness to your children, maybe your grandparents, and that is your time and your place to witness. Uh, we are all called in different, different places. I, I want to point out in this verse, and actually uh, Pastor Jerry mentioned this to me, and I had never pulled it out of this verse, but it's actually really cool. Uh, it says, you're called to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, when this scripture was written, uh, Jerusalem was kind of like the location of where this scripture was directed to. Judea, Judea was a little bit further out of the community. Samaria was actually even further out, and it was a community of people that would have been a little bit more difficult to reach. They weren't... Uh, they were not Jewish. They were, um, I guess you would say, more heathen in lifestyle. And then it goes to the end of the earth. So it's, it kind of goes for us in relationship. It would be, you know, you have your family, you have your local church, you have your community, you live in Ludington, and then you go a little bit further out and you've got uh, West Michigan, you've got Michigan, you have even a little bit further out and you've got our nation, the United States, and you go even further out and you've got the whole world. You have the corners of the earth, the end of the earth. Well, not all of us are called to go uh, out of the nation, but we do have some people that are called to go to the ends of the earth, to all nations of the earth. And I am actually really excited. Um, I, you may not know this, but we have missionaries that we support here at Radiant Church. And uh, I, we have this morning Paul and Marcy from the Philippines here today. So come on up. So Paul and Marcy, yeah, take a seat. Paul and Marcy are my dear friends, and uh, they have... I have actually been friends. We, we've supported Paul and Marcy uh, since before Jerry and I actually were at this church. And uh, Paul and Mar Marcy and I have been friends, we figure, about 20 years. And uh, they, Marcy was called out into the mission field uh, at a very young age, and Marcy and I went on our first mission trip together to the Philippines. So that is so amazing, and I'm, I, I'm so honored that through the years, we have been able to keep in touch and do ministry together and share our lives together and be, really, we've been a great encouragement to each other. But um, I would like you to share some things about what you do in the Philippines, you and Paul. Um, would you share with us what ministry looks like for the, for the two of you and, and your family in the Philippines? What, what is your ministry in the Philippines? Sure. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having us today. Such a great blessing. Um, 
I think I'm going to let Paul start with what it's like in the Philippines. Paul is a Filipino, born, raised, and grew up there. So um, yeah, he can describe it best. Marcy and I and our family are not only uh, missionary in the Philippines, but we're doing other countries also, which we cannot say it in public. But in the Philippines, we're doing two things in ministry. Uh, we're, doing, we're mobilizing the church for Great Commission, for evangelism and church planting. And uh, we have our vision uh, to have a church in every community. When we mention about church, it means people. The book of Acts is, uh, tells us that church is not a building. It's people. People worshiping the Lord, like us. We are the church. And the Lord will come back to a glorious church, not a building by you and I, right? So this is the vision of our family and the ministry that we are doing. But we are also hosting missionaries from the U.S., from other countries to come and uh, uh, to do crusade for evangelism again. Evangelism, going and discipling people. Uh, but our main, main task really is to mobilize the church. Wherever we go, not only in the Philippines, but for other countries, we're really mobilizing, training the church for going and uh, teach them to start a Bible study, discipleship. Because Jesus, his discipleship is Bible study. He went with his disciples anywhere and teaching them the Bible. And then the uh, baptism, and then teach them to obey what I have commanded you. We need to teach everyone what the Lord, the Lord commanded us. What is the last command of Jesus? Is to go. Sometimes we forget this going. Sometimes we think of, come to church, come. And the pastor will tell us about the salvation, about the love of Jesus Christ. No, the great commission is go. You and I need to go. There's a lot of people need Jesus out there. If we, like 1 Corinthians 5, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come, right? This is you and me. And not only that, he said, but he has given us this ministry. What is this ministry? To reconcile the world to God. This is you and me. So everywhere we go, in the Philippines, training the church, training the whole body of Christ for the Great Commission. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. So the picture that you see above, um, this is just one example of a village that we were able to go to a few months ago. Um, usually what we do as, is we meet in churches, existing believers like yourself, and just help every believer to know how to articulate their own testimony, how to pray for the sick, and then how to share the gospel in a very simple way that anybody could do, in a way that's very, um, very simple. So <clears throat> when we went to this village, every single person came out and we were able to share the gospel with them. So this is Paul and everybody just meeting in the jungle. But the truth is that everywhere we're at, whether we're in a park or at the grocery store or in the middle of a jungle, people are people. And all of us have a sense of brokenness or a sense of if we're close to God or far from him. And so we're able to connect with them and just share how God has healed our own brokenness, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, whatever it is, and how God has brought us close to him through Jesus. So um, I think we have some other pictures, but we were able to share even in practical ways like food and water wells and teaching people trades. But the bottom line is that every believer should know how to share the gospel in a very simple way so that when we see the brokenness in the world, we can also show them how they can receive the same kind of healing and being reconciled to the Father God. So that's our heart. Um, we just love sharing Jesus and especially seeing the church rise up and really step into who we're meant to be, who is spirit-filled and sent out. Yeah, awesome. Paul, 
Now, I don't know if you caught this, but he said in the, uh, when he first started speaking, you mentioned that there are countries that you go into that you can't even, I won't mention, there, but there are countries that they, they're, they're headquartered in the Philippines, and the Philippines is an open country to the gospel, uh, but there are countries that are not open to the gospel, and we actually support uh, we support you guys. We have other missionaries that we support that go into countries that uh, are, you, you don't just say, hey, I'm a missionary and I'm here preaching, uh, but there's there's persecution that happens. And I know that you can't mention where you go, but what what is that what is that like going into a country that doesn't receive Jesus? Oh, that's a good question. All right. Um, the truth is, like I said before, is that people are people. And the, I guess if we look at it from a human perspective, it might seem like some places are harder than others. But I'll tell you the truth is, every single country we go to, the Christians will tell us that their place is the hardest, including America. They'll say, oh, yeah, but it's harder here. Every place we go says that. But Jesus didn't have the same diagnosis. When he looked at the world, he said, the harvest is plentiful. The problem is not the harvest. The problem is the workers are few. The Christians who are willing to share and to activate the spirit that's inside of them to share with that lostness and bring light to the darkness are few. That's the big problem. The problem is not the resistance, it's not the persecution. But I want to read this to you because when we were in worship, this has never, never been highlighted to me in the same way. The same verse that, G, that Paul was talking about, if you go further, it says, as God's partners, this is 2 Corinthians 6, 1, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. He's not talking about your salvation. He's saying, I'm reconciling the whole world back to me. It's a great salvation. It's great for you, yes. But don't ignore it after you received it. We have to realize that he's reconciling everyone back to him. And so for me, the problem is not the resistance. Every place in the world has different kinds of challenges. We work in countries that Every major religion of the world is their primary religion. We work in Buddhist countries, Muslim countries, Hindu countries, Taoist, Roman Catholic. The problem is not persecution. The problem is the willingness of the church to rise up. So that's, that's really a challenge. That's why we love to spend time with believers and fan into flame and say, like, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is inside of you. What does he want to do? He wants to reconcile the whole world. All of the brokenness we see around us, we can't just complain about it. All we have to do is run into the darkness because people are actually longing for him. He is the desire of every nation, of every person. That's, that's really good. Um, I've, I've actually never thought about it that way. Uh, and I, and I, I think I agree with you, uh, you know, doing ministry in the United States, and I, and I have heard this a, a lot, it'd be like, you know, oh, it, it's, it's so hard to minister here in the United States. And, and I agree, but I love that. I think that was really eye-opening to, to say, actually, no, it is hard everywhere. And, and there's different reasons why it might be hard in one country uh, versus another country, but, but really, no matter where we go, we do have the Holy Spirit with us, right? Yeah. I would say it's challenging. Sure. But it's actually not hard because the Holy Spirit does what we cannot do. He does every part we can't do. And that's what makes it so much fun. Seriously, when you start to step into this, it's just addictive because God moves in such amazing and fun ways. And just seeing somebody set free, there's nothing like it, you know? Yeah, amen. That is that is really awesome. And I agree with that. Uh, we've both been in ministry for 
20 years, and Jerry and I have been pastoring this church for seven, seven and a half years, and uh, there, it's painful. There's times where ministry is actually really painful, but it is all worth it when we see uh, people's lives being transformed, and we do, and that is a great encouragement, uh, and, I'm, and I, I can see that for you as well. Um, now, would you, would you share a little bit about how you physically get into some of these countries that, say, an average American, you know, would, would not be able to get into to these areas? Okay, I'm just going to be really honest. There are very few countries in the whole world that you cannot get into. It's not that hard. <laughs> get a passport. <laughs> And buy, a, and buy a ticket and you go. But I think the most important thing is connecting with believers on the ground. Um, how, how, how are you connecting with <laughs> believers on the ground? I know, but I want the church to know. All right. So in every country that we do work in, we always work with the local church and local believers. So we're not flying in there on our own. We're partnering with what God's already doing on the ground. Because the truth is that there's enough believers in the world to reach all of the lostness very quickly if the church would rise up. Let me say that again. There are enough believers in the world, in any country, that we could reach all of the lostness in the world pretty quickly. The problem is that we have been closed-lipped. We've been too silent. We've been passive, and we've assumed that people don't want him, but they do. He is the hope of the nations. He's the hope of every heart. So how do we get in? Paul wants to answer. <laughs> Give me a chance there. You know, I'm, I'm so zealous with Americans because your passport can go anywhere. <laughs> My passport, very limited, even to come to the U.S. I need to apply a lot of exams or a lot of uh, interviews to come to the US. So that's, that's, that's an opportunity for you to share the love of Jesus Christ to other nations. But we have also people here in America to share his love. So I think that's okay. <laughs> it. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> but I mean, I guess when we what we do is we always partner with believers on the ground. Out in Asia, the Christian world is a small world, but it's a tight-knit world. If you know a believer, you'll know a lot of people. So we always work in community. We always connect with who's already on the ground. And um, in, in some situations, we have set up like business visas in a country so that we can enter easily as things may crunch down or have more political problems. Yeah, awesome. So uh, Marcy and Paul are here alone, but they have four children, and they do mission work with with their whole family. And you know, Jerry and I, we look at ministry as as a family. You know, it's not just Pastor Jerry doing ministry. It, it's Jerry and I and our kids, and and actually, we're really blessed here at Radiant Church. We have three generations, uh, Pastor Jerry's, uh, we've got Pastor Keith and, and uh, Diana, and uh, so, well, anyway, so we, mis- ministry is a family affair. So, Marcy, this is your beautiful, beautiful family, and uh, would, would you share with us uh, how you balance, because I, I know you, you, you are just all out for ministry. You run hard and fast. Uh, you have such a deep passion to share Christ with people. And every time I talk with Marcy, she has something new that, that is some, something new that she's doing, a, a new outreach. And would you share with us how you balance all of that? And because you guys travel a lot. So we move approximately every two weeks. Um, The mission house that we call our base, we spend an average of five days a month there on average. So we might be out for three months and then in for a couple of weeks, something like that. Um, Let's see, how do we balance ministry and our children? I think I like to look back and get a broader perspective of things because in the past, children were really meant 
uh, believed to be meant to be seen and not heard. And in the ministry, they were literally sent into, like, uh, I don't know you call those, like missionary schools or boarding houses, boarding houses, um, while the parents did ministry. But today, I feel like we've swayed to another side of the pendulum where all of the decisions in a family are often seen through the filter of the children. And so when making a decision, we think what would be best for our family, AKA the kids. But for us, the way that we find balance is looking at it through a Jesus filter. And I don't know, (laughs) because we move so fast and we cover a lot of different countries and we move around a lot, people would often say like, how do you not get burned out? And how do you find balance? Balance is a big word. And for me, I had to pray about it because people were kind of pressing us like, maybe you're running too hard. (laughs) Maybe you're pouring out too much for Jesus. And um, when I prayed about it, I saw this picture. Rachel and I used to be backpackers. We used to, um, yeah, summit mountains together holding like 40, 50 pound packs. Neither of us are very big people, but we would do it. And this is the picture I got is that balance to me doesn't look like a nine to five walking on a sidewalk and continuing to do the same things. And in reality, it's not for any of us. Every single day we have to make choices and we can't afford to be on autopilot. So balance is actually like backpacking. When you're holding 40 or 50 pounds of weight and you're climbing a mountain, every step Your foot has to feel the terrain and know how to balance. And so in the spiritual realm, I liken this to listening to the Holy Spirit for every single decision. Like every day we have to know what's the balance right now. Do we we stop and drop this and spend time with the kids or do we bring the kids along? You know, how do we balance our family? But it's through a Jesus filter where the number one thing is that Jesus' last command to go and to preach the gospel, his heart to reconcile the world back to him. That's the filter, is that we have this direction and then the details we can work out, right? We're gonna, we're gonna go in this direction for sure. So we don't, uh, we don't filter through what our kids, um, just through our kids or just through our family, but we try to center on Christ first and then work out the details. And I often say, It's not easy, but he's worthy. (laughs) To be honest, traveling with four kids is has its own challenges, but I am sure (laughs) I am sure that that it does. Uh, Jerry and I have three kids, and uh, it is a lot of work. So, but a lot of you have families as well, and I know in our culture in the United States, uh, it's just this resounding: "Oh, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm busy." What speak to that? Uh, it, speak to that uh, to the people in this church. Um, how do you balance? Uh, because we're also very busy. And how do you balance m- ministry? Because we are called. We that commandment is on all of us to be witnesses and and to disciple. What kind of encouragement would you give give to us in that? Um. To be honest, I'm I'm a very driven person. I obviously love to do a lot of things. And so I understand the busy button and the busy life, the autopilot. But I think having like that compass of vision and purpose, like what's our vision and what's our purpose? Um, When I go into the, you saw that picture in the middle of the jungle. If you ask those people, if they can spare some time, you know what their answer will be? I'm busy. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. It's actually a distraction. We're distracted, and we, we really need to draw in and focus. Okay, if this is our purpose, so one thing Paul and I do for our family is that at the end of every year, which is our wedding anniversary, we have a prayer retreat And we make sure that our purpose is aligned, or our our life, our schedule, everything is aligning with God's purpose for our family and our life. 
because we have to stop and make sure that we're aiming in the right direction. And some things we have to stop doing. Sometimes God will give us new things to do, but so we don't get stuck, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a that makes a lot of sense. And and actually, when you were saying that, I I think sometimes I, I do respect, uh, I do understand that a lot of us we have careers, we have children, we're balancing all of those things. Uh, but to be prayerful and mindful of of your priorities, mm -hmm. uh, what would God? What is the direction that God would have me to go? Um, and and really seek that from the Holy Spirit, because really we are limited with how much time we have on, on this earth, but Another right? thing is that the world has a lot of people, billions of people. So even in our busyness, we're rubbing shoulders with people who need him. Exactly. So it doesn't have to be a totally different, separate thing. It's not a waffle where we have to separate our time with, <laughs> with sharing Jesus. It's right. like whoever's yes, right exactly. in front of me, I can love on them and pray for them. It takes like very short amount of time. Yeah, that that's really that's really good because you know we've got like soccer moms and we've got career-minded folks and and in that in in their daily walk you you are rubbing shoulders with people and these people need to hear the love of Christ. Yeah, I think one of the essential thing for that is that you need to pray because he said pray to the Lord of the harvest, right? So. If you are consumed already with children, with family, and you're not praying for others, you will not have it, right? It's like taking chocolate. You will not say chocolate is good if you haven't tried it. <laughs> so pray first. Like Matthew, it's the same word in Matthew, Luke and Matthew. There's also in Matthew, he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborer. But then he said, then go, and I will send you. He said, you pray. And then you go. Because you cannot feel it, you will not, you will not pray. You, you should start praying. Pray for your for family that does not know Jesus yet. Pray for friends that doesn't know Jesus yet. Pray for them. Pray for them daily. And then you will feel it, the need. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit will guide you there. And eventually, you don't know, oh, they're, they're believing Jesus already because you start in prayer. And one, one thing also is that we need to have the heart of God. Because if we don't have the heart of God, this is just like, they're people. They're just my friend. They're just my neighbor. They're just my, my family. But if you have the heart of God, you know, I'm a father. I have kids. If my only son will die because of other people's sin, that's a big deal. I don't, I don't know what I will do. But that's what happened to Father God. He sent his only son to die on the cross. Not to save himself, but to save anyone. So if we have the heart of the father, the willing to give his son, or we have that heart also, the willing to give our time, willing to give the word, willing to spend our money, willing to pray, I think we can do it. Amen. Amen. So specifically for our church, and, and we, we talked about, you know, a little bit about uh, being a Christian in the United States. Uh, what, and, you know, we have people that uh, we, we interact with on a daily basis that we know that we need to share the love of Christ with. Uh, how, how would you, how, how do you feel we should be missionally minded mm -hmm. here at Radiant Church? All right. Okay, this is going to be big and scary. Ready for this? First, talk to people. Yeah. Do you guys know how to talk to people? It's been a lost art for some reason. But I feel like here in Ludington, people are a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, friendly and talking to people. But really, when you talk to a person, they usually share a little bit of a window into their life. You know, you share, a, if you just give a little bit of attention and care for them, and uh, sharing your, a little bit about your life, which is your testimony with them. You know, uh, we can really easily lead people to Jesus. It's not difficult. 
So when you talk to people and be friendly with them, I, I would say that's the first step. If you're not used to cracking up a, a conversation with somebody, I would say practice. Just say something nice to somebody, get, pay them a compliment until it becomes comfortable. And then learn to slip in your own testimony, something that God's done in your life, some way he set you free. And then if they share something about their own life, offer to pray for them right there on the spot. They're really not difficult things. It's really not. But what it does is it stops us from looking at everything from a human perspective or a human point of view. Uh, Jesus said this to, to Peter. He said, uh, get behind me, Satan. And we usually stop there like, whoa, that's a huge rebuke. And we talk about that. But we don't stop and think about what Jesus said after that. Do you know what he said after that? He said, you are a dangerous trap for me. What would be a dangerous trap for Jesus? He says, you're looking at things only from a human point of view and not from God's. Wait, what? You're looking at things only from a human point of view and not from God's. So when we look at our conversation with a person, it's not that big of a stretch. It's look at that person the way that God would see them, somebody who's broken in some ways, somebody who might feel far from God, and then say, you know what? God wants to be close to you. He'd give his whole life for you. He did. Well, you have a really great way of really making it really simple, uh, right to the heart of God, right? And we are all on this journey. Uh, I've been saved for a really long time. Uh, I actually, were you saved as a, a teenager, a kid? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when I, have, we met. I have a typical West Michigan testimony that's yeah. like a roller coaster. But when I was in my senior year of high school, I was 17, is when I radically gave my life over to God. So this is really, uh, I love the story. Um, when we met, I was an intern at a church for college ministry. And many of you know I'm going on a mission trip this winter. And I was actually doing the same thing. I was uh, talking to people, getting them uh, signed up for a mission trip. We were supposed to actually go to Africa, and it changed. And we were going to the Philippines. I had a little informational table set up. And here comes Marcy in her uh, really fancy high heels and uh, really large fur coat. Uh, <laughs> And I, you came to the table, and I was like, hey, you know, you should uh, come on this mission trip. And do you, do you know what my, uh, Marcy shot me down. Marcy shot me down. But, uh, but you did end up going. The Holy Spirit changed your heart. Uh, yeah, you, Okay, ahead. so from a human perspective, I looked like a fancy person, maybe. And I said, oh, it's kind of pricey, you know, for a trip. Um, but the reason I had approached the table is because when I was eight years old, God called me to be a missionary. And I had never gone, and I saw that missionary table. She didn't see that. She didn't know it. But the Holy Spirit was doing something through her and in me. So it was really a pivotal time. Yeah, and, and through that, with what you were saying earlier, it's having a conversation, uh, having, having a conversation about God and what he's doing in your life. And in, in, and we all have a different testimony. And the amazing thing about your testimony is nobody can argue it. It's yours, right? And God is doing that work in your life. You know, so people want to argue scripture uh, in that, but they can't argue the the work that God has done in your life that belongs to you. Yeah. And um, so share that, share that with people. And, you know, I took the time to talk to Marcy and invite her on a mission trip, and it's been life-changing. I also want to encourage you that most Christians uh, don't know how to share the gospel. And if you feel like that, like, I just don't know what I would say I have a suggestion. Um, you can learn anything on YouTube. <laughs> I'm serious, you guys. Uh, men fix vehicle, whole vehicles on YouTube. But 
there, <laughs> there's a lot of tools. Become articulate in sharing the gospel in different ways. Become articulate in it. This is the one thing Jesus left us here on earth for. Otherwise, when we receive him as our savior, we might as well go straight to heaven. He says, no, I have a mission for you in the world to continue the work, to reconcile the world back to me. So one, if you're writing things down or you have your cell phone, I, I, I highly recommend this one. It's called Three Circles Evangelism Tool. Three Circles. And it just keeps it in modern language. You don't have to quote a lot of Bible verses. It doesn't sound preachy. Um, and maybe just practice articulating it, even if you don't use the visual. But it's important that we know how to share with somebody in a way that can bring them into a relationship with God. Yeah, you know, that is, that's a really good point. It, it is funny, like, oh, go on YouTube and learn how to share the love of Christ, right? But we are in a season and a time when uh, God's word has never been so available. I was uh, talking with my 13-year-old, and uh, she has a friend who's going through a difficult time, and uh, she... Christina was sharing with me that she, there's a, it's called the Bible app and it's got uh, actually videos and she was looking up particular scriptures on how to share uh, with her friend. Uh, so yeah. I, I would add the YouTube thing. You might find a lot of examples of what not to do. <laughs> Um, so use your own filter. Use the Holy Spirit for sure on right. that. Yeah, actually, I don't let uh, I don't let my kids use YouTube. But uh, for us that have wisdom, you know, there is a lot of junk on there, of course. Uh, but there is a lot available to us more than has ever been in any season. So you cannot use an excuse that. Uh, you don't have God's word available to you. It is available and ready. Um, and God wants you to know his word and share his, his word. So for, for you guys, uh, I want to pray for you guys. And what, what would you have for us? Uh, what would you like us to pray for you in, in, in your mission? Um, I think... I think it would be wise to pray um, some of the prayers that from the scripture that God would give us the right words to speak. He would put his words in our mouth, that he would give us the boldness um, to continue. And um, we really want to ask for prayer for more workers. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to warn you, but Paul said it, that when you, when you pray for more workers, you realize that God's calling each one of you to, to rise up. And don't ignore the gift he put inside of you, okay? So pray for more workers. The last one is one of the countries we work in is in a very brutal and very hard time right now. And we just pray that God would open a unique door for us to be effective there and to re-enter. All right, right now, uh, Paula Mercy, I just want to pray over you guys. If you guys would just extend your hands in agreement in prayer, we're going to pray for for Paul and Marcy. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good work that they are doing overseas, Father God. Lord, that you have called them to this season and time in, in Asia, Father God, and we thank you for that, Lord. I just ask, God, that you would give them a renewing of your love for your word, Father God, that they would just be passionately seeking you, that you would give them deep revelation and understanding of your word that they may share it with those around them father god i thank you for their family for their children that are also in ministry with them father god i ask that you bless them and keep them close to your heart father god i ask that you protect them lord as they are growing up uh, on the mission field father god i thank you for the sacrifice that they are giving uh, for your word father god i thank you for that father Lord, and I just pray for this congregation, God, that, that the words spoken this morning would, would penetrate deep into our hearts, Lord, that we would have on a daily basis, God, a heart to, to be a witness, Father God, that we would disciple those around us, that we would call those to the local church, and that we would encourage our brothers and sisters, Lord, that we would be a, 
a, a shining light in our community, Father God. Lord, I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you for your word, God. I thank you for your Holy Spirit that never leaves us, that is here guiding us every day and every moment that we need you, Father God. You are, your presence is always with us. Lord, I thank you that you are so good. Lord, thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.